Let's continue our review of vector calculus. We talked about points, we talked about line, and now we'll continue by talking about closed line. And we'll define the closed line integral, which is the line integral defined on a closed line. Closed line are interesting enough that we want an operator specific for them. So for example, if our vector field is a force, the closed line integral will tell us the work done on a closed line, and if this work is zero, then the force would be conservative. If the vector field represents uh, the velocity of a fluid, the integral along a closed line would tell us whether the fluid is turbulent or not, in which case the closed line integral would be zero. As we did with the line integrals and the gradient, now we ask ourselves what is the closed line integral of the gradient. As we saw before, the line integral of the gradient is just the difference between the value at the beginning of the line and the end of the line. But now in this case, since the line is closed, the beginning of the line is also the end of the line, so the initial value is also the final value, so the difference between them is zero. So the line integral of a gradient is always going to be zero, no matter the line, and no matter what scalar field. So this is a general property. Now everything that we want to do as before is define a local counterpart of the closed line integral. And this again, because we have uh, this notion from physics that things that are close to each other affect each other. So we want to take the line integral and make the line smaller and smaller. Now, of course, we're going to have the problem that uh, the line integral is going to go to zero as the line is going to become smaller. So we want to divide it by the surface enclosed by the line so that the value becomes finite. Another problem is that we have to define a shape. Now, we don't want to go into the details of that. Let's just imagine that the shape we choose is essentially a rectangle, so it's defined by a plane and two orthogonal directions. Now, of course, we need to define on which plane we make the line integral, so we need to, to define a direction, and therefore, this operator is going to be a vector. And we're going to name this operator the curve. So we're going to take the curve of a vector field and get a vector field. So let's try and calculate the curl along the z direction. So here is our path, here is our rectangle. The sides are dx and dy, which may in general not be exactly the same. So on this side, we have the x components times dx, and we write it here. On this side, we have the y component taken at x plus dx multiplied by dy. So we have it here. On this side, we have uh, minus the x component of the field at y plus dy. So we put it here. And on this side, we have the minus uh, the y component multiplied by dy. And we put it here. And we divide everything by the area, which is going to be dx dy. So let's collect uh, the, the parts that have the y component here. And so we have ey x by dx and ey. We know that the dy simplify, and what we are left is the partial derivative of the y component along x. On this side, something similar, just with the minus sign, the dx simplify, and we have minus the partial derivative of the x component along the y direction. So if we do this for all the other components, we get the known result that the curl of the vector field is the vector product between the nabla operator and the vector string itself. And we can write this in index notation by using the levi civita symbols. Now, when we said before that the curl is a vector, it's actually not true, not, not really precise. It's a vector only if we are in a three-dimensional space. Let's say, for example, that we are in a two-dimensional space, then there is only one plane on which to calculate uh, the curl, so no direction is to be given, and the curl becomes a scalar. If we're in a four-dimensional space, we need two perpendicular directions to define a plane, and therefore the curl will be a rank 2 tensor. So really, the curl is not a vector in general, it's a tensor of a rank n minus 2, and if n is 3, then we get a curl. This is important to understand some things later, so we'll just put it here for now. And as we saw before, the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field, so we ask ourselves, what is the curl of a gradient? The curl, as we saw before, is an infinitesimal closed line integral. And we also saw before that the closed line integral of a gradient is zero 
no matter the line, no matter the field. So the curve of the gradient is zero. We now ask the reverse question. Suppose that we have a vector field whose curl is zero. Can we say that that is the gradient of a scalar field? Of course, the answer is yes, and this is a nice geometrical way to see that. First of all, we're going to show that if the curl of the vector field is zero, then all the closed line integral on the vector fields are going to be zero. Why is that? Well, consider a closed line integral. If we divide the loop in two, then the overall line integral is going to be the sum of this closed line integral plus this closed line integral. Now, for the whole line integral to be different than zero, then either this or this must be different than zero. If they're both equal to zero, then the sum is going to be zero. Well, we saw before that the curl is the closed line integral of all possible infinitesimal closed lines. So any line is going to be the sum of a bunch of curls. And if the curls are all zeros, then the whole is always zero. With this in mind, we can do the following. Consider now two points, O and P, and consider all the possible line integrals that go from O to P. Now, if we take any of these two, these are going to make a loop. And so the closed line integral on this loop is going to be zero. So this line integral minus this line integral has to be zero. This line integral minus this line integral has to be zero. This line integral minus this line integral has to be zero. So for all these closed loops to be zero, all these line integrals are going to have to be equal to each other. So the line integral from O to P doesn't really depend on the path uh, that we are taking. It only depends uh, on the initial points and the final point. So for each final point, we can define a function, U of P, that is going to be the line integral from O to P, plus uh, an arbitrary value that we're going to assign uh, to O, which could be zero. Now, if we calculate the difference between uh, P and O, we, of course, get uh, the line integral. But we also know that the line integral of the gradient of u is going to be equal to the difference. So this part now has to be equal to this part. But for these two to be the same, no matter on which line we do the integral, then e has to be equal to the gradient of u. So if the curl of e is zero, then E must be the gradient of a scalar field, which we call the potential of E. So to sum up, we work with closed line. We defined the closed line integral. We saw the curl as the limit of the closed line integral. Then we saw that the closed line integral of a gradient is always zero. And then if we have a vector field that it's a gradient of a scalar field, then its curl is zero. And if the curl of a vector field is zero, then the vector field is a gradient of some potential. So we finish with line and we step up now to services. In the same way that we, uh, we define the line integral to ask what is the component of a field along a line, we define the surface integral to tell us what is the component of a vector field going through a surface. So how do we define that? We take the surface, we divide it in lots of different pieces, we take the component normal to those pieces, we multiply that component with the area of each of those pieces, and we sum it up. Then we take the limit and make these pieces as small as we can. And that is indeed the definition of our surface integral. If the vector field were a velocity of a fluid, it would tell us how much fluid it will throw through the surface. And again, we could divide the surface integral by uh, the area of the surface, and then we would get the average uh, component of uh, the vector across that surface. So as we saw before, the curl is also a vector field, so we ask ourselves, what is the surface integral of a curl? So again, we take the surface, chop it into pieces, and for each piece, we take the component of the curl that it's normal to the surface. But the component normal to the surface is going to tell us the closed line integral around that point divided by the surface. So it's going to be this quantity. But when we are taking the surface integral, we are multiplying this quantity by the area. So this part and this part simplify. So what we're doing is summing all the line integrals for each of the pieces. 
Now what's going to happen that each side that it's inside the, the surface is going to be taken one time with a positive sign and the other time with a negative sign. So all the internal sides are not going to give any contribution, just the sides that are on the contour are going to give us a contribution. So what we're going to get is that the surface integral of a curl is just the line integral of the original vector field along the boundary. So we sum up, we have defined our surface integral, and we saw that the surface integral of the curl gives us back the line integral of the field along the boundary. But I think this is a good place to stop for now.